can't do that. Shoot her or something. In this video, we're going to look at all of the civics available to normal biological empires, and we're going to rank them in a tier list. We won't be looking at civics for megacorps or gestalt consciousness empires in this video, but don't worry, updated videos on those civics will be coming out soon. It is very important to also know that I'm only trying to rank the civics here and not the councillor positions. I will be talking about councillor positions, but this tier list is based on what the civics does and not necessarily what the councillor position does. A separate video ranking the councillor positions in a tier list is going to be coming out soon, so pay attention for that. Without any further ado, let's dive straight into the tier list. As usual, we're going to start at the bottom with the lowest tiers and work our way up. The F tier contains some civics which are actually kind of harmful, but generally all civics do give you some sort of bonus. These F ones are just so useless that I don't really recommend you take them. Efficient bureaucracy reduces your bureaucrat upkeep by 20% empire wide. That is bureaucrats and priests if you become a spiritualist empire. Your bureaucrats and priests will also provide some edict funds scaling with their unity production. Starting off, this is going to be a round two, which isn't very much. That additional edict fund production is basically extra unity that you can only spend on edicts. From the very start of the game, you actually won't have enough edicts to make use of this. There will be a brief window where it does seem somewhat useful, and then later on as your empire size gets higher and higher, that will rapidly dry up. What it does not affect is your culture worker jobs, and as culture workers are the best way of producing unity in the game, this is just a little bit crap. The corvée system waives all of your unity costs for pop resettlement, and provides you with a 15% boost to pop growth from immigration. Unity costs for pop resettlement are very, very low, especially if you are sensible and strategic and only move workers around. We're talking 10 unity per pop here. On top of that, immigration is not a mechanic that is actually very effective for boosting additional growth. You will get some early growth from it, but later on, especially in the mid to late game, immigration completely flatlines when your empire is very, very, very large and therefore that modifier becomes completely useless. Environmentalist has had a little bit of a rework since the last time we looked at it. You can construct ranger lodge buildings, which add ranger jobs and produce unity for every naturally occurring blocker present on the planet. Those ranger jobs produce a very small amount of society research and a modest number of amenities. They also produce a tiny amount of energy credits, food, or minerals, depending on the natural blockers you have present. The Ranger Lodge Overlord Holding Building you get access to is reasonably nice. You're going to get some extra bonuses from that by putting it on your vassals, but not amazing. You'll also get minus 20% pop consumer goods upkeep. That is rather nice, but still not that much. Overall, that 20% is going to mean you can afford to have an extra couple of scientists at the start of the game without needing to pay for them. Later on, that becomes worse and worse. Important thing to note here, however, the first warden council position is definitely very good. Reducing pop amenities usage by 1.5% per skill level is really quite nice. If you take into account the first warden position, this probably creeps up to the C tier, possibly low B tier though the other bonuses are not amazing. Ranger jobs are pretty crap. Freehaven grants, like Corvée system, 15% pop growth from immigration, but also an additional 50% immigration pull. This has the same issues with immigration being pretty useless, especially in the mid to late game, as Corvée, so yeah, don't take it. Shadow Council is highly thematic, but also highly crap. You'll get a 75% reduction to election cost, 10% additional ruler pop resource output, and plus one code breaking. That ruler pop resource output, unless paired with another civic, basically means you're only getting 10% additional unity. Amenities are not resources, so are not included there. 10% additional unity on only rulers is kind of rubbish. The election cost reduction 
can be nice if you are running an oligarchy, reducing how much it costs in the first 20 and 40 years when you have your first real actions, but later on when your unity production is rather high, those election costs are so minimal that it is a joke. With democracies, yes, again it reduces the cost, but unless you're doing some really weird things with your democracy, your starting ruler should pretty much be guaranteed to stay in if they stay with the right faction. Warrior culture replaces your entertainers, which usually produce amenities, they're the biggest amenity producers in any empire, with duelists. Duelists use alloys as upkeep rather than consumer goods, and they then output unity amenities and naval capacity. You also, in a fun thematic way, replace conserved fauna jobs with gladiatorial beasts. You'll get plus 20% army damage and plus one mercenary enclave capacity. You want to minimize the number of entertainers in your empire and, if possible, get your amenities from other sources, so replacing those with duelists is mediocre at best. Combining that with the fact that duelists use alloys, a resource we really, really need as much as we can get of to make our ships, combines to make warrior culture kind of rubbish. The only real reason I think you should consider taking this is if you really really want to do a mercenary run and you want that plus one mercenary enclave capacity from the start. Pleasure Seekers allows the decadent lifestyle living standard. This will grant a plus 20% happiness boost to all three of your pop stratas but it comes with a hefty consumer goods upkeep cost. At the top level, that is one and a half consumer goods for your leaders, your rulers. Very, very expensive. You'll get a little bit of pop growth from entertainers, but as I mentioned previously, we want to minimize the number of entertainers where possible, and your servants will produce five additional amenities, so slaves, servant slaves, become quite nice. In fact, from a pop efficiency perspective and resource efficiency perspective, they're probably better than having entertainers now. The reason this isn't very great is that when we compare it to, for example, stratified economy, a living standard you can get simply by being authoritarian, the overall happiness increase on a planet was going to be around 12%. That's basically the same as idealistic foundation, but coming at a massive increase in consumer goods upkeep. You're getting a lot of political power to your rulers, but they're only actually gaining a 5% boost compared to stratified economy or a 10% boost compared to decent living standards which already gives us additional boosts for our rulers. And with the political power here being weighted so heavily to rulers, that means rulers are very very important. So if they're not going up that much, it's not going to have as big a stability impact on your worlds as you would think. And I feel I need to say it again, for the consumer goods price you are getting this at, it's simply not worth it. It is so crippling, especially early in the game. And if you're enjoying this video, please give that like button a decadent lifestyle. Pompous Purist comes with an amazing benefit if you hate the AI sending you pacts and agreements. You can only engage in diplomacy with other empires if you are the proposer, so you will never receive another pact again. Outside of that, it all kind of sucks, and that's why it's down here in F tier now. It gives you plus one available envoys. At the moment, envoys are trash. You use them for spying, improve relations, or harming relations. That is it. You cannot use them now to stack them in the galactic community to get more galactic voting. So, yeah, why, why would we really need them? Except outside of the few we already have for infiltration and espionage. And we've generally got enough. Envoy improve relations of plus 25%, diplomatic weight when opposing resolutions plus 15%, that's nice, but does not qualify it going up a tier, and external leader pool size minus one. The Grand Marshal is a notable council position I should bring up, plus 2% diplomatic weight per skill level is rather good. That is a nice extra bonus to have for a councillor if you're struggling in the galactic community and need a little boost. Byzantine bureaucracy suffers from a lot of the issues that efficient bureaucracy does. It grants plus one stability to bureaucrats and plus one unity from bureaucrats. This also is incompatible with spiritualists, so you cannot stack it on priests. Given that culture workers are the best way of getting additional unity and getting a culture worker building on every planet is a great thing to do, you'll probably have minimal bureaucrats. 
Unless you spec heavily into a bureaucrat arcology planet, a bureaucratic humanopolis, this bonus is never really going to be very helpful. And even if you did have quite a few bureaucrats, you would need to have 10 bureaucrats on a planet to get an extra 10 stability. Merchant Guilds does one thing. Your capital buildings will provide merchant jobs. Merchants are basically the same as your regular uh, politicians, except they produce quite a bit of additional trade value. This by itself is rubbish. You're going to get a little bit of extra trade value on each planet. However, if we look at the council position director of trade, you'll see that you gain an additional 0.4 trade value from each trader per skill level of the councillor. That alone is a fantastic council position and kind of means if you're going to go for a trade build, which in the current patch I would try to warn you against, trade is really, really not very good anymore, then you almost certainly want merchant guilds for the director of trade position. But not looking at the council position, it is clearly F tier. The only benefit from this civic really is that director of trade position. Selective kinship is the space racism civic. You will get a plus 100 opinion modifier of empires that share a species class. This means if you are mammalian, all other mammalian species, you will like just a little bit more. Your opinion of other empires goes down by minus 50 though. Pops of our shared species class will always have full citizenship, and all other pops are barred from full citizenship, because of course, they look all funny. This, however, and I'm really surprised to say this, is not an economic advantage overall. There are better ways of getting these bonuses than with selective kinship. If you share a planet with another species of the same species class, your citizens will get plus 7.5% happiness. And if you oppress another species class, so let's say you have a weird fungus on your planet, you'll get an additional plus 2.5% citizen happiness for a maximum possible bonus of 10%. That is equivalent, if we jump through all of the little hoops, to the same pop happiness bonus we get from Idealistic Foundation, but there are lots of extra hoops that we have to jump through. In this case, space racism is not economically viable. Diplomatic Core is basically unchanged compared to previous patches, but the game has changed, making it really, really crap. It still grants plus two available envoys and plus 10% diplomatic weight. However, we can no longer use those envoys in the galactic community, so this is no longer a pseudo plus 30% diplo weight. With that being the case, it sits down here in the F tier. Mutagenic Spars allows you to build a building of the same name that grants bath attendants. Bath attendants provide plus 1% pop growth speed on your planet per industrial district, with a minimum value of one additional pseudo industrial district that's added in. So for example, with two industrial districts, you will get 3% pop growth speed added per bath attendant. So with two bath attendants, that's plus 6%. However, this comes with a minus 0.75% penalty to happiness and minus 0.2% penalty to habitability per pop. Given that habitability reductions also decrease pop growth speed, that means that effectively your pop growth speed is not 1% additional per industrial district, it's actually more like 0.8725%. On top of that, habitability also increases your amenities usage, your upkeep from both living standards and, and other things. It's really, really bad to be reducing that, and we're reducing happiness, meaning we're reducing stability, so lower resource output from jobs and lower trade value. This is not a good thing to do. This is effectively harmful for your planet. Exalted priesthood like merchant guilds replaces some politician jobs with high priests. High priests aren't much better than politicians. They produce an additional, and wait for this, you're gonna be blown away, two unity. You go from six to eight. Now, you get a modifier of plus one unity production from priests empire-wide, which high priests also benefit from, so in fact it goes from six to nine. Plus three unity from politicians, and that's just one out of every two politicians, along with plus one unity from priest, is not worth an entire civic slot. There's great thematics here, but absolutely crap mechanics. Eager Explorers is a civic that is basically a challenging origin. 
you'll have 10 fewer pops, and you will also start without a few technologies that you really, really need. In place of that, you'll get some weird form of FTL that's basically a pseudo jump drive at the start of the game. It's very annoying because you cannot queue up multiple jumps at once, so you have to micromanage every single part of your exploration, that sort of thing. You will get some bonuses, but overall none of this is um, outweighed by the terrible, I really do mean terrible fact you start with 10 fewer pops. Only take this Civic for the theme, and if you want a bit of a challenge. Heroic Past grants you plus one capacity to officials, commanders, and scientists. That is it. The council position is pretty nice, plus 2% governing ethics attraction and plus 2% leader experience gain per level of the councillor, but the actual modifier here is really not worth it. Because of how much the devs walked back leader capacity, it's not too bad to go over your leader capacity by one or even possibly two for each type of leader, so this Civic really has no niche anymore. It used to also grant us effective skill or effective leader level or something like that. Now it just grants us the capacity and it's really not worth the pixels it is illuminated with. Dimensional Worship allows you to build dimensional shrines in systems containing wormholes, astral scars, astral rifts, L gates, or shroud tunnels. The shrines provide a flat plus 10 unity. Early on, that is a rather nice boost to have, but later in the game it's, it's really not useful. You'll get plus 25% monthly astral threads, and a 100% increase to the chance for astral rifts to appear in systems you control. You also get plus 1% chance to rare technologies. That is fine, but it's such a minor increase that really I don't think you'll ever notice it. This Civic does pair rather nicely if you go for the Astral Origin. However, outside of that, it is completely F tier. Don't touch it, don't take it, probably don't even look at it. We're now up to the C tier, and we'll just have to see what kind of Civics we can find here. Agrarian Idol is quite a thematic and fun Civic. However, it does have a couple of drawbacks. Your Generator, Mining, and Agriculture districts provide one more housing. Your city districts, however, provide one less housing. On top of that, every four agriculture districts will grant you a building slot, and your farmers produce, in addition to their normal production, two amenities. What it doesn't tell you here is that Agrarian Idol is locked out entirely from building Ecumenopolis worlds, as those are the best worlds in the game, the most efficient worlds for producing alloys, and also other resources as well, this is a massive, massive drawback. It does get a little bit more powerful if you're combining it with catalytic processing and you're producing lots of food anyway. That does make Agrarian Idol possibly B tier, but for a regular playthrough, you're going to want to minimize your farming jobs, and thus you're probably not going to want to take this Civic, especially when we're looking at those negatives I just mentioned. Aristocratic Elite replaces some of your politician jobs with nobles. Nobles produce, in addition to the regular politician output, plus two stability. You can also construct the Noble Estate Building, which grants you an additional noble job. On top of that, your leaders have a 20% chance to start with an additional positive and negative trait, because of course they're inbred nobles or something. Early on in the game, this Civic is basically plus two stability. You build an estate, it's plus four. And later on, once you've upgraded your capital enough, you'll go up to plus six stability. That's slightly better than police state, which we'll look at in a moment at plus five, but we have to jump through extra hoops to get there. There is a small secret benefit from having nobles, and that is they grant additional authoritarian ethics attraction. But given that there are so many ways of getting more governing ethics attraction now in the game, with all of those leader traits that give that to us, I really don't think that you should take it just for that. Thematically, it's beautiful. Gameplay-wise, it's not really that amazing. Feudal Society had a period where it was really, really, really good if you had lots of vassals. Now it's just kind of okay. You can ignore the diplomatic requirements when proposing subjugation, 
which means you don't need as much trust. And that simply speeds up the subjugation process if you're trying to do it diplomatically, but that's not really that amazing. Your subjects cannot have the following agreements. Expansion prohibited, do not join subject wars, and limited diplomacy. So you have a reduced palette of different options for your vassal contracts. Looking at the modifiers, you'll get plus 5% naval capacity contribution from your subjects. That's a nice bonus to have, a nice amount of additional naval capacity. It's nowhere near as good as a satrapy, and overall that's going to be very minimal. Your subject acceptance goes up by plus 25. That means you can get slightly better contracts, and you get now one subject exempt from divided patronage. Before it used to completely exempt you from divided patronage, now you just get plus one. Given the new rules with truces at the moment, which I hope will be changed, you no longer really need to worry about divided patronage as long as you are continually going to war and dragging your subjects along with you. If they have truces, they cannot rebel, and therefore you can kind of ignore the relationship, so feudal society is both nerfed and in a lot of ways useless. Before we move on, I want to briefly talk about the flavorful bits of this civic that have been entirely removed. It used to be that you would get some unity from your governors for employing them, they're now called diplomats, so bleh. And it also used to be that you would not be able to fire any of your leaders. That's entirely gone, it's now just all about subject interactions. Idealistic Foundation grants you 10% citizen pop happiness, which is basically equivalent to 6 additional stability. That's fine, that's pretty nice. You also get a really juicy council position here, the Tribune of Rights, or Tribune of the Plebs, granting minus 1.5% pop amenities usage per skill level. That is a very juicy and very useful council position, which when looked at in combination possibly bumps this up to the B tier. Imperial Cult gives your home planet additional priest jobs, and gives your empire an additional 100 edict fund. Because we now get lots and lots of edict fund from our rulers, especially if we take something like Philosopher King, this leaves Imperial Cult in kind of a weird position. You probably don't want to take it just for the edict fund, you also don't really want to take it for the priest jobs. Early on that edict fund can be rather nice, it allows you to run more edicts than other empires without needing to lock in an ascension perk. There is that plus 100 edict fund ascension perk but it totally drops off later on in the game as your empire size scales up. I think there is a brief window to take this, probably around year 20 until year 50, and then you want to leave it alone again. Nationalistic Zeal gives you minus 20% war exhaustion gain, minus 15% claim influence cost, and plus 5% diplomatic weight per rival. The standard bearer council position granting plus 1% naval capacity per skill level is also rather good. If you combine this civic with the enmity tradition, so you're running lots of extra rivals, and you really care about your diplo weight in the galactic community, nationalistic zeal can be really nice, probably putting it up to the B tier. Otherwise, it's solidly C tier. Police state grants you plus 5 stability, making it pretty much equivalent to idealistic foundation. You also get plus 1 unity from enforcers and telepaths. This is better if you go with oppressive autocracy for your second civic, because you'll be running lots of extra enforcers, and if you go for a psionic ascension, it is even better when you've got lots and lots of telepaths running around your empire. Slaver Guilds gives you plus 10% slave pop resource output empire-wide, which is nice, but we have to remember that only affects worker-type slaves and not specialists. It also gives you an enslaved pop ratio of 35%. What does that mean? Well that means every species, no matter what the rights are, will have a portion of their species enslaved, 35%. Unless you enslave the entire species, in which case it goes up to 100%. Why is this not amazing? Well, enslaving a third of your species means that you either need to have your species set to indentured servitude, so you don't really get any resource output bonuses, and they will also get some political weight, so you could have issues with their happiness levels, 
or you have to set them to something like chattel. And if you set them to chattel, you cannot have worlds dedicated entirely to specialists. You can't have research worlds, you can't have unity worlds, you can't have alloy worlds, because 35% of the population will be locked to the worker tier. That is a crippling economic inefficiency. It's kind of nice how slaving has gone from being the most efficient economic way to run the galaxy to less so. I think that kind of lines up more with the reality of the situation. Technocracy replaces one of your politician jobs at the capital with a science director. Later on, as you upgrade the capital, that can become two. Science directors produce unity and amenities like a politician, but they also produce plus six science, which is currently equivalent to two researchers. That basically means you will start the game with an additional science lab without needing any pops to work it. That's nice, but not amazing. Your scientists will start with a random expertise trait, meaning you'll get some bonuses to research in some categories, and your expertise traits now have additional effects. Basically, if you employ that scientist as a governor, you'll get additional resource output from that research type, for example, if it's propulsion, more engineering research output on the planet where that governor is working. You'll also get plus one research alternatives, which is definitely strong early on in the game, but drops off massively as you get more and more research alternatives. Due to the fact that research output has been heavily nerfed and research costs have been heavily increased, tech rushing is less viable than it used to be, and therefore technocracy is less useful than it used to be. Ascensionist grants your own planets plus one ascension tier at the game of the start. And uh, yeah, let me check my notes. Right, because you only have one planet, that means your capital gets plus one ascension tier. Not amazing. You will get plus 25% planetary ascension effects, which is okay, minus 10% planetary ascension cost, and the best part of this civic, I would say, minus 25% tradition cost from empire size. That of course gets better the longer the game goes on and the larger your empire size gets, meaning your traditions will be slightly cheaper than your neighbors. In order to take idyllic bloom, you must have either a fungoid or a plantoid species type. This will basically allow you to slowly convert your worlds into Gaia worlds without needing an ascension perk. You build four stages of buildings which upgrade the Gaia planet. On top of that, when you complete it, you'll also be getting some pops on your Gaia planets every now and then, which is rather nice. However, the main downside here is that you cannot add or remove this civic after you start, so it's locked in, preventing you from taking other things. Once you've terraformed every planet to a Gaia world, it would be great if we could get rid of this civic, but we can't, and we also still have to pay high upkeep costs on those Gaia Cedar buildings on the planets. They don't go away once we complete it. So yes, you get Gaia worlds, but you pay heavily for that. And I should clarify, you are paying in energy credits and exotic gases. Shared burdens is the communist civic in Stellaris. It allows you to take the shared burden living standard under which all pops have a moderate consumer good upkeep regardless of their strata. It disables basically all other living standards and grants you access to the communal housing outreach holding. On top of that, you will get a special luxury housing building on your planet that grants less amenities but more housing. That's honestly worse than the regular luxury housing. You'll also get plus five stability and minus 45% pop demotion time. Shared burdens is a worse living standard than it used to be because the basic living standards have been improved quite a bit. So the main bonus here really is that plus five stability. Vaults of Knowledge had a brief period of being utterly amazing when leaders were utterly broken. Leaders have been somewhat reworked now to be less broken than they were at the time of the release of Galactic Paragons. It allows you to build the Vaults of Knowledge building, which honestly you should just demolish as soon as you can. It gives you a small amount of unity and a tiny increase to leader experience gain based on the number of level eight leaders that you get, the number of destiny traits you acquire. That leader experience gain bonus is minimal and the unity gain is minimal. The main bonus here is you get effective counselor skill of plus one and leader starting skill level of plus one. 
Combining this with some other things means you can get your leaders at a starting skill of around five or six, which is good, but doesn't allow you to just roll off a level eight destiny leader whenever you want. The Keeper of the Vault position on the Council is also really quite nice, minus 2% leader upkeep and minus 2% leader cost per skill level. That will help you out with your unity. It's not amazing, but possibly pushes this up into the B tier overall when we look at the entire holistic effect of the Civic. Crusader Spirit is a very thematic Civic. Your commanders will start with the Crusader trait, which is actually quite good and you can only use the Liberation Wars policy, meaning you can't really conquer other empires, however you can liberate them and convert them to your ethics. A very fun way to create a galaxy of like-minded equals. You will get plus 5% ship's weapons damage, which is a nice bonus, and plus 5% ship build speed. We no longer get any ship build cost reduction from this Civic. If we did, it probably still wouldn't go up a tier, because the main bonuses here are the theme of the Civic. It's not really that mechanically powerful. I do have a special place in my heart for Crusader Spirit, however, and personally, I love playing with it. All right, we're almost at the end of the C tier, and it's time for a C Cratch call out. Uh, thanks if you've actually decided to watch through this and not skipped ahead and jumped around. Let me know down in the comments below. Try to slip the word crusade into your comment and let's have a little bit of fun with this. Dark Consortium is a civic you cannot take after the game has started. You will start with the dark matter drawing technology already researched and a dark matter deposit in your capital, giving you one additional dark matter per month from the game start. You can sell that and get some extra energy credits and then use those energy credits to buy a few more things, giving you a slight economic boost. You also get special access to dark matter breakthrough council agenda and special dark matter edicts. The council position is also pretty good and I think we should mention it. The Shadow Weaver position grants you 0.02 dark matter per skill level of the counselor per researcher in your empire. So you can actually get a reasonable amount of dark matter generation from your researchers alone. You are however locked into this civic at the start of the game and cannot change from it. So the economic boost is good, but yeah, you are locked with this thing for a little while. We're now up to the B tier and we're actually over halfway through this tier list. There's actually pretty good balance at the moment amongst the civics with just a few exceptional standouts that we'll get to in a little bit. Cutthroat politics is a very simple civic. You get minus 20% edict upkeep and plus one code breaking. The reduction in edict upkeep at the start of the game isn't going to be very noticeable, but later on, especially in the mid game before your empire is too large, this can probably let you run an additional edict, which is definitely quite powerful. Functional architecture is another simple but powerful civic. You get minus 15% building and district cost reduction, meaning your starting buildings and districts are just that little bit cheaper. Combining this with some other bonuses can be very, very useful early in the game and plus one building slots. This means you can build an additional building, surprise, surprise, on every planet without needing to invest in that extra city district. That saves you an extra 500 minerals, or in this case, a bit less with a building cost reduction and quite a bit of time. Early on for an early start, this is very powerful, but as the game goes on, it becomes less and less relevant. If you take this Civic, you should probably swap out of it by the time you get to the mid game. Mining guilds, again, very, very simple. You get plus one basic mineral output from all of your miners. That of course scales with any bonus percentages you get added to either worker output or miner output. On top of that, I do need to mention chairman of the mines. This is quite a nice council position that grants you plus 0.05 stability per skill level per miner on a planet. Meaning you can spread out your miners just a little bit amongst your worlds to get quite a nice little stability boost. This civic is particularly good when combined with the subterranean origin or when used with lithoids. Beacon of Liberty grants 15% monthly unity, which is good, and an additional minus 15% empire size from your pops. 
Empire size penalties for technology have recently been doubled with the most recent patch, and as pops are the largest source of Empire size, getting a reduction there can be very useful in the mid and late game. Early on, this Civic is good for the Unity bonus, and later on, the Empire size reduction does help quite a bit. Inward Perfection is the ultimate Sim City Civic. You get lots of bonuses to your monthly Unity, pop growth speed, extra edict fund, more happiness, a little bit of extra encryption, but you basically cannot engage in any external diplomacy, and you cannot go to war. This is also a Civic that cannot be added or removed after the start of the game, so you can't take this and switch playstyle. It is important to remember that it can be possible to remove this if your government reforms through an event, for example if the Chosen One becomes your leader and you move to being a Chosen Imperium. Philosopher King gives you plus 5 effective ruler skill. At the start of the game, this can be very, very nice, especially for dictatorial or oligarchic administrations. You will get lots of additional edict fund through this and whatever extra bonuses your ruler outputs. So in the terms of an oligarchy, that's more councillor experience gain, and for dictatorial, that's a big reduction to pop amenities usage. The Lord Chancellor Council position is also rather nice, partly because it grants Councillor experience gain so you'll level up your councillors faster than ever, but also because any type of leader can occupy that slot, making it a very versatile council position. Memorialist basically upgrades your culture workers. Because culture workers are the best way of generating unity from any particular job, this is really good. You'll get an additional 5 stability for every 2 culture workers, so at the max level 3 building, you will get an additional 15 stability on pretty much all of your worlds, because you do want a culture building on all of your worlds. There is a small mineral upkeep for this, but honestly, I would not worry about that. 15 stability for a single civic is really, really good. Reanimators allows you to build the Dread Encampment building. This gives you necromancer jobs and allows you to recruit undead armies. On top of that, you will actually get undead defense armies on the planet rather than regular defense armies, which are much, much better unless you're fighting against robots. The necromancers turn consumer goods into society and physics research, which is okay, and a bit of naval capacity, which is also pretty nice. But the undead armies here are the real meme. Undead armies, when they kill a regular biological army, will roll to spawn an additional undead army. So your defenses can actually grow the longer you're in combat and the more enemies you kill. This makes taking your worlds much more difficult and generally means the AI underestimates your garrison strength and a lot of times some players will as well, so you can defeat invading forces with what seems like smaller armies. If that wasn't enough, you can also resurrect leviathans like dragons and bring them into your navy. When you research debris, you can either get research points or get resources from the defeated fleet. With scavengers, you get to have both. You get your cake and you can eat it. On top of that, you will sometimes salvage entire ships from the debris. If you are constantly on the war footing, this is a very, very nice civic. But if you don't go to war, then this honestly is down in the F tier because it will have no impact on your game unless you're fighting and winning battles. Relentless Industrialists can build the Coordinated Fulfillment Center. This gives you a nice boost, and honestly it's quite a good boost at 20% to alloy and consumer good output, at the cost of reduced population growth. It will also gradually turn your planet into a tomb world. However, there is a situation that fires allowing you to either stop turning them into tomb worlds entirely, or kind of go hard into the process. If you can offset the disadvantage of having tomb worlds and negative population growth, for example by synthetically ascending, this is honestly an amazing civic and is way up there in the S tier. Otherwise, for other empires, the pop growth modifier is somewhat unpleasant, especially early in the game, and you really don't want to put this down on every world, just the worlds that really need it. Oppressive Autocracy is quite an interesting civic. You're forced into the dystopian society living standard, under which non-ruler jobs have decreased consumer goods upkeep, 
it is very, very low. It's quite lovely, actually. Only ruler jobs and enforcers have amenities upkeep, so you don't really need to worry too much about amenities, but only rulers can generate amenities. So you need to make sure that you put a few luxury housing buildings down on every planet to guarantee full amenities everywhere. You can also combine amenities usage reductions really nicely to easily get plus 20% happiness, which is the maximum happiness bonus of being over your amenities usage, very, very simply. Most pops will generate one crime, but that's fine because we'll have more enforcers. This slightly reduces our pop efficiency in terms of having more enforcers, but massively increases it because we will never need to have entertainers or any other amenities job. It's actually quite a nice system. <clears throat> Your leaders also get minus 20% upkeep and you get plus one commander capacity. This civic pairs very nicely with police state, who would have guessed, but it also works well with aristocratic elite. Last up in the B tier, we have a new civic hyperspace specialty. This one grants the hyperlane breach points as a guaranteed research option, which is nice if you're wanting to push into getting your hyper relay network up as quickly as possible. You also get low intel on all systems within three hyperlanes of your starting system, guaranteeing that if you have guaranteed habitable worlds, you will know exactly where they are. This allows you to optimize your early game to a very high degree. You'll get plus two planetary sensor range as well, so you'll find even more planets more easily, and plus 10% sublight speed, which is good for not just combat, but also exploration, and a juicy 15% additional research speed bonus. On top of that, the council position is pretty unique. Hyperlane Supervisor grants one stability per skill level of the councillor for Hyperlane Registrar Starbase buildings. That means you can stack with both the Deep Space Black Site and this building easily 15 stability from your starbases in all of your systems. That is very, very good. Before we jump into the next tier, I would just like to say that, of course, there can be subjective opinions with any tier list. Playstyles differ and what people think is a good playstyle and what we place importance upon in any game changes from person to person with differing opinions. I would of course love to hear your opinions though. If you agree with me, if you disagree with me, if you think something is completely in the wrong place, please let me know down in the comments below. Your opinions do matter quite a lot. I go back and take a look at them before looking at any future tier lists to re-examine my own thinking and try to work out if any of my base assumptions are wrong. We're now up in the A tier. There's actually only a few civics left to go through. These A tier civics generally don't work in combination with other A tier civics, except for a few examples, but they are quite powerful as a unique extra civic to tack onto your civilization. And often they change the game in quite a fundamental way to provide you a special playstyle or some extra special bonuses. Citizen Service provides a 15% boost to naval capacity. That limits the number of ships we can have in our empire. Ships are a direct reflection of your power in the galaxy and you always need more of them. So boosting your naval cap is very, very good. On top of that, this civic provides plus two unity from all your soldier jobs. That unity will be scaled by other unity production bonuses, so you can actually get quite a decent production from all the soldiers you honestly will need to have to boost your mid and late game naval capacity. This isn't necessarily a great civic to start off with, but it is fantastic in the mid game, and if you're going to pick it, you probably want to pick it by then. Distinguished Admiralty can be added to any civilization that is some degree of militaristic and it is always good to have. You'll get 10% additional ship fire rate, plus 10 to your fleet command limit so your fleets can be larger, meaning your better leaders can supply their bonuses to more ships. You'll also get 20% commander experience gain and plus two commander starting skill level. Combining that with other bonuses means you should be able to get your commander starting skill level easily up to five, six, or even seven by the mid to late game. That is very, very useful when you're pumping out fleets and you need commanders to place on them. On top of that, the Lord High Admiral grants naval capacity and ship starting experience, meaning your ships will always be a little bit better than if you didn't have the Lord High Admiral. Fanatic Purifiers has some very, very strong bonuses. 33% fire rate, 
33% army damage, minus 15% ship build cost, and a whopping 33% additional naval capacity. On top of that, the Minister of War Production grants 2% monthly alloys per skill level. Everything I've just read is amazingly powerful. If that is where this civic ended, it would easily be in the S tier. However, you are completely locked out of diplomacy, meaning you cannot take vassals, and cannot access the galactic market. Those are both bad things. If that wasn't enough, you also will be hated by all of the AI empires, and if you're playing multiplayer, probably player empires as well. Unless you're playing some sort of PvP deathmatch, this is clearly A tier. In a PvP deathmatch where diplomacy is more than just game mechanics, yes, it's, it's almost certainly S tier, but for most play, it can be difficult, especially for newer players, to have to deal with AI empires that are constantly wanting to end your existence, just as much as you want to end theirs. Masterful Crafters replaces your artisans with artificers. Artificers produce an additional consumer good and two trade value. On top of that, for every three industrial districts you build, you will get a building slot, except on habitats. This means you do not need to build as many city districts to get access to your building slots, specifically on forge or consumer goods worlds. The additional benefit you get from artificers also means you can more comfortably run a militarized economy and not suffer as much from reduced consumer goods output because your base output is just that much higher. Barbaric Despoilers allows you to use the Raiding Bombardment stance without having to take the Nihilistic Acquisition Ascension perk. You will get decreased opinion from other empires, which isn't great, but the other benefits generally outweigh that. You also get the Despoilation Casus Belli against other empires. That is a very nice one, allowing you to steal basically minerals and energy from empires you go to war with. On top of that, you also get plus one mercenary enclave capacity, so you can build some mercenary enclaves if you'd like to. It's generally quite a pleasant civic if you're going to go on the aggressive and feel like stealing pops from other planets to offset your possibly limited pop growth. Death Cult allows you to build sacrificial temples. These temples have death priests that are basically regular priests but slightly better, and mortal initiates. The mortal initiates can be sacrificed using an edict to provide some empire-wide bonuses. This civic is particularly good if combined with a clone army early on. The issue is, the longer the game goes on, the larger your population becomes and the more pops you have to sacrifice to get the good bonuses to be of a reasonable level. As pop growth is more closely tied into the number of colonies you have rather than specifically the number of pops you have, this means that your pop replacement rates go down as your population increases if you're not also increasing your number of planets apace. This means it is in effect more expensive the longer the game goes on. You might be a little surprised to see anglers all the way up here in the A tier. Now, anglers locks you into having an ocean world capital and being aquatic. Those aren't necessarily a bad thing though. What it does do is provide you with one of the best starts, and I really, really do mean best starts for any biological empire around. Your agriculture districts will be uncapped and farmers, each two pairs of farmers from one agriculture district, will be replaced with one angler and one pearl diver apiece. The anglers produce eight food and two trade value, that's more than a regular farmer, and the pearl divers produce six consumer goods and two trade value. This means that from the start of the game, you can switch your capital designation over to being an alloy world, allowing you to still have plenty of consumer goods along with plenty of alloys. More alloys than basically any other start possible for a bio empire. This bonus does dip off a bit later on in the game once you start unlocking Ecumenopolis worlds, because you cannot build agriculture districts on an Ecumenopolis and therefore will have to go back to regular consumer good production. I do also need to note here, when you combine this with catalytic processing, it is very much up there in the S tier. It is really, really good. Sovereign Guardianship is the only civic in the game that truly allows you to play a tall empire. 
I've done a full video on how you can use this Civic to get an unlimited number of pops, an infinite number of pops in fact, by combining other reductions to empire size from pops and getting zero empire size from pops. And therefore you can have, as I said, an unlimited number of pops, but a limited number of planets, whilst all being under 100 empire size, thus not suffering any increased penalties to tech cost or tradition cost. The other bonuses here are fine, plus 20% diplo weight, unity from soldiers. The first citadel job is crazily good, actually. That's a crazy, crazy council position. But the main bonus here really does come from the fact that you can unlock, using this civic, a total of minus 100% empire size from pops reduction. We've reached the end of the tier list pretty much. We're now in the S tier and there's actually very little to discuss. These civics in the S tier are good no matter what your playstyle is and no matter what empire you are playing. That's why they're up here in the S tier. They will work no matter what is going on. Put them in any build and you will have a better time. They are just all around amazing. Meritocracy provides plus 10% specialist pop resource output and plus one additional leader trait options. This has two main bonuses. First off, our leaders will be better. We will be more able to select better traits for them due to the fact that we get an additional option. Specialist resource output is like gold dust in Stellaris. There are very few sources of this and if you can find it, you should take it. Given how we have lost a bunch of techs that give additional output for researchers, actually 60% additional bonuses are currently being lost, this specialist pop resource output is more essential than ever for not just alloys, unity and consumer goods, but also for tech. Parliamentary system is a very powerful civic to start the game with. However, you might want to swap out of this a bit later on, but you also might not. Your factions will spawn immediately, roughly, after your empire begins its game. This gives you two big bonuses. First off, you'll have very little in terms of ethics disparity amongst your empire. They'll pretty much all follow your starting ethics. That means these factions can quite easily be made happy and thus grant you up to plus 10% happiness bonus empire-wide. That is equivalent to idealistic foundation. But wait folks, that's not all. Factions also provide extra unity for us, so we will have increased unity production when compared to other empires. If that wasn't enough, we also get a 40% boost to faction unity gain from this civic. After getting your faction spawning, you may want to swap out of this, as I said, into something else because that faction unity gain isn't essential. The council agenda speed of plus 3% per skill level for the Speaker of Parliament, however, is very, very good. Agendas are great. You really want to complete them as fast as you can, assuming you have enough that you don't run out of agendas to run. Before I talk about the last civic in the tier list, I'd like to thank Big Farmers for sponsoring this tier list. The reporting on this channel is, of course, entirely unbiased and free from commercial influence, don't worry, you can trust me. And there definitely isn't a gun to my head, I'm, I'm not being told to say this, but what is now, I would say, the most powerful civic in Stellaris is, and I'm terrified to say this, but catalytic processing. This, when combined with something like anglers, is simply insane. What does it do? You replace your metallurgists with catalytic technicians. These turn food into alloys. So far, so boring. Your chemists, translucers, and gas refiners have their minerals upkeep replaced with food upkeep. Okay, that's all right. Why is it so powerful then? Well, when you convert food into alloys, you use more food, but actually you won't notice that because your food producers, your farmers, make equivalent amounts more compared to miners. So actually the upkeep is literally the same from a pop efficiency perspective, and they produce a base of four alloys rather than three. This is further modified by other bonuses, but it's pretty much a quarter to a third increase in alloy production empire-wide. And the only thing you need to do is make sure you have some farmers instead of some miners. That is it, that is the only change. You need to make sure you replace some mining districts with farming districts, and then you get a massive boost to alloy production everywhere. It's really, really good. If that wasn't enough either, we have the principal catalyst council position granting 2% metallurgist output 
to all of our metallurgists. At max level, we can knock that out to at least 20%, if not with some other bonuses, 24 or 26% additional metallurgist output. This is crazy. This is really good. Alfre, you've, you've changed my mind, sir. Catalytic processing is the best. You, you've gone and done it. Now, now go and nerf it. If you've enjoyed this video covering all of the civics for Normie Bio Empires in Stellaris, but you're wondering which origin should I pair with these civics, then you don't need to worry anymore. If you'd like to watch my origins tier list, click the video on screen now.